Uh, all right, hello and welcome to KCP Community Meeting February 8th. Uh, we have a couple items on the agenda and I think a couple more I will add while we're talking about the first two. Um, is Paul here? Possibly. I am. He is, amazing. Uh, yeah, I don't know, like you said, it doesn't need a discussion. Uh, P3, prior, uh, prototype three scoping uh, to be completed this week. Do you have anything else uh, you want to talk about on the topic or anybody else feel like chiming in? Nothing to add here. If you have questions, please uh, let me know. Great. I guess the, the output of that is in that doc, just, I know that's probably obvious, but. Uh, does, can somebody add that doc link to this or I can in a little bit? Yeah, we're, we're looking for the issues created within GitHub and they should be in the milestone themselves. So they should show up in our project. Uh, okay, so migrating from the doc to GitHub, got it. Um, okay, I will add. I will add the doc link so that we can move them to GitHub uh, soon. Uh, all right, uh, already, Steve. Okay, so now I already, already migrated the pieces in the doc oh, into fantastic. the issues for us. We're we'll good there. Oh, fantastic. Uh, Steve, do you want to talk about sharding cockroach? Wow, wow. <laughs> that just that appeared at the exact right second. Um. Okay. I I tried to put some some thoughts into here, um, but basically uh, I've spent the last like two two and a half weeks looking at uh, some of the nitty gritty impl implications of of sharding KCP, um, and uh, I, I guess I'll I'll just try to run through what I have written here. Um, but <clears throat> so for this for the last like like two months or three months or whatever we've been looking at option one for the storage engine for kcp which is assembling a bunch of discrete etcd clusters uh which is something we need to do because etcd holds everything in memory and we have like a, a scale limit for one right and it's been clear from the beginning that we have a bunch of problems that we need to solve if we do that um how do we provide consistent list watch like we do need to have these different parts of our key space talk to each other and be able to say things about them together. Um, and so the rabbit hole that I just went down was, you know, consider data movement between shards, providing reasonable guarantees on the resource version exposed to users. And, you know, at least in the implementation we were looking at that at some point requires us to start locking rights and being able to cut over. Um, and then we started going down the rabbit hole of what does it mean to lock rights, uh, and arrived at how might we implement that with storage level transactions at the etcd layer. Um, and I think the end result of all of this, other than these documents, is an understanding of like exactly how much cost there is to all this stuff. So there's a bunch of behaviors that we think are going to be really nice in KCP. So like being able to mark workspaces read only, not only for the movement case, but also for um, like audit, uh, enforcing some sort of strict quota, just so that the multi-tenancy here is bounded. Um, and then having a performant and simple mechanism for storage version migration, um, since we expect that to be a much more fluid concept. Um, and all of these problems require distributed consensus about the state of some data in one etcd cluster, even in our sharded case, like generally we're talking about one cluster. Um, and so we have solutions or there are attempted solutions for this, like on top of etcd. So they're using CRDs, they're in like the Kubernetes user space. Um, and all of them are pretty complicated because ultimately you have to, like for instance, in the locking case, there has to be an understanding of like, I have an HA like, API server and all of them understand that this part of the key space is locked. And what what is the point at which that happens, right? Like that's the distributed consensus problem that shows up in all these. Um, and so while there are solutions on top, you end up with a bunch of complexity about like who saw what when, 
what happens if one of them falls out? What if we restart an API server? What if one of them dies or what if we scale up? You know, all of that comes into play. So those solutions are pretty complex. And one insight was, since we have a transactional data store and we're talking about transactional things about the data, what if we just use <laughs> the transactional data store? So the implementation there like looks very simple, right? Like being able to say, you know, I want to write this key as long as it's not read only is a very simple thing as soon as you're at that CD level. Um, but, you know, one of the scary things there is that we're talking about changing the storage layer you know, for etcd, which is right now at the very bottom of cube, and like every character in that file uh, has a pretty large implication on the performance characteristics of cube, basically. Um, and it's it's a pretty complicated set of, of code to change. Um, so kind of bubbling up the stack, you know, not only do you have like potentially extremely complicated stuff at that layer, then, you know, even if you're not doing that, you have a pretty complicated stuff in the user space. Um, sharding opens up a bunch of questions. Like for instance, uh, Stefan and I were thinking if you're watching discovery, for instance, uh, and some part of that discovery is coming from data that you're replicating from the org shard, what is the resource version on an object that exists somewhere else, but is also mirrored? Like you have a bunch of these like very quirky little cases and there's a lot of thinking needs to go into it. So bubbling up another layer of the stack. Oh, we're doing all this work because we're thinking about option one for the storage engine, which is this multi etcd situation. There are other options, um, namely like option two says, what if we just use a geodistributed database? We get to ignore all of that. <laughs> um, um, like, Steve, can, uh, I, can I ask a question? I yeah. don't understand this jump from option one. Everything is complicated. Why should option two solve any of that in a better way? Because everything we described here is basically on one shard. The only exception is maybe the movement, but everything else is one shard. Why is etcd worth like touching etcd storage, the storage abstraction layer in cube? Why is this worse than doing option two in the same code? Uh, I think for one thing, we might have an easier time writing some of these transactional things. On a, on because a language is, is because the, the translation language is better in Cockroach or what is maybe maybe a way to say it is they're both actually very large and if the requirements like if you're already opening up the door for a large set of things on the first side that have to be correct and you have a higher layer of problems uh, maybe like another way to say it is it's not necessarily worse. It's the error bars and the, the magnitude is large and the error bars are high on the complexity. And that's kind of leading to where Steve was going, which was worse is different from there's a bunch of moving parts. Are we make, are we over solving one part of the system while not actually contrasting it to the alternative? I can see that. I mean, there are use cases like the movement and probably some others like quota, cross shot quota. I get those. But those are not the ones we are talking about. I mean, they are by implication, right? Like every problem that requires cross shard things goes away. Um, like I think Mara and I had a long conversation about how does an author of a controller that's watching something across shards handle the fact that they have a potentially incomplete set of state that gets synced behind the scenes, right? Like you even have an entire set of documents about what does it mean for us to give incomplete data and how do we talk about that with the user? How do they make sense of it? Like but, all of the problems don't but exist. I, I don't say, I don't believe that. I think we are exchanging dragons, which we saw now with new dragons. I don't talk about uh, against option two, exploring that we should. But I right. think it's not so, to think that option two just has no dragons. I don't so think. I guess what uh, my conclusion is here is that um, we understand the cost of option one, at least better now than we did before. Um, yeah. It's pretty large. <laughs> so I think it seems appropriate to delay explicit work on that um, until we understand better the other options. So I was going through like the mind process of like, what does it mean to not do this? So like, why, why are we sharding? We're sharding because we have so much data we can't fit it into one etcd. Is that a problem we have today? No. 
Um, when do we think we might have that problem? So there are cases with Cube where you're looking at you know 10K namespaces with a bunch of users. That's somewhere in that range, it starts to fall apart. We expect a pretty different access pattern for workspaces. You know, we're not like exploding the number of secrets and service accounts and all this stuff in every single name or every single workspace. So we might even see better performance or might see worse. I don't know. But um, in any case, I think like the scale problem seems far enough away that we can risk waiting until we understand better what option two looks like. I'm not saying give up on one or the other, but uh, maybe po postpone the work for now. And then some of the other stuff, like does this uh, hamper our ability to provide like some of the other things that we're really hoping to show? So the transparent multi-cluster stuff doesn't really have any impact. Like they, they're fairly orthogonal as far as I can tell. Um, from the consistent list watch across workspaces sort of situation, I think it might it'll be easier, much easier if we assume that we don't have an HA KCP and it's not sharded. Um, basically, all of these consensus problems boil down to do I have consensus with my n of one? And the answer is always yes. So we can move quickly to show these features and then understand better later which of the two options we need to take and which one we're going to take the cost of. Um, so yeah, I think from my perspective anyway, what I see is it makes sense to wait a little bit. And I think it doesn't impact our ability to provide some of the things that we're really excited about. Um, this is not uh, me saying this from on high. Obviously, I'd love to hear other people's thoughts on this. Um, but I think this gives us a pretty good amount of breathing room so that we can understand Options two and two and three better from the from the um, yeah. storage level. I think this pitch is much better. We should learn about option two because if we if we don't do that, like, postpone that, and even model our system after option one, we might lose something. And I and some some of the other problems, um, like like Steve raised a good point when we were going through this, which is the this is probably a measure twice cut once thing which is the access patterns of transparent multi-cluster the access patterns on workspace any additional operational requirements like they were anticipating running a multi-tenant control plane service which to be fair kind of underdeveloped right now like we haven't even really tackled things like would we actually want a snapshot of workspace for reason x and be able to restore it holistically to its exact state. Is that going to be something we have as a requirement? Uh, we will probably have a better idea two months from now or three months from now on some of the non-functional and functional characteristics. And not that we don't have to understand them, just like we're, we're changing the order around is we'll have some experience that can ground the exploration and more time to accumulate um, trade-offs as well. So I think I, I think I agree with, with uh, Stefan that the framing of this sounds good, which is basically uh, this is not our biggest, most urgent fire. We can put innovation into other stuff for now while we figure out the access patterns of the, the stuff that's coming down the pike. Do you have like specific things you want to do to investigate option two? Like, so now it makes sense to now investigate option two. We've investigated the hell out of option one. We think it's roughly this big. It's not time to like completely divest option one and do uh, put everything into option two. We're just gonna like go to get it. Are there specific investigations you want, plan, hope to do? So Clayton has some ongoing. I think from my understanding, the, the biggest worry there is the performance of watch. Um, I think, I don't know, he's thought about this a lot more than me, but I would I would assume that at some point, some sort of like large scale simulations might be useful. Um, one thing that I noticed when I was doing performance simulations on hacking that CD layer is like, the setup is kind of really important. So like if etcd was not already the bottleneck in your cube cluster, it did not matter. Like you could 
multiply the amount of transactions that you did to etcd by 10 and not see it a blip in how long it took to do a patch um similarly like a small amount of writers can increase the p99 for a small a large amount of readers but like maybe not in the other way so i think it's kind of tricky and you almost have to have a little bit of an understanding of what your access pattern looks like and then because it's so intertwined but um i guess that would be since i understand the largest downside there being the watch performance i would i would kind of think that would be the next step but i mean like, how how far are we from some prototype implementation of the storage layer where we can test that the guarantees we get from cockroach as the, as we want. so the guarantee so i think there's like three parts of that so i got and I'm still trying to get the last part of this doc. I haven't even really documented a storage schema. I just have the sketch of what the storage schema, like roughly it boils down to why Cockroach versus any other database is because Cockroach, you can actually model a uh, multi distributed consensus with a serializable ordering of events. So you get the etcd history mechanism and co compaction is already built in. And you can get a reproducible watch stream that roughly matches the watch semantics that we already have in etcd it doesn't have a total ordering but we've already kind of started poking at whether total ordering is even possible um and i think roughly like we don't even really guarantee total ordering if you're behind an informer today so there's already like a bunch of we've weakened some of the key guarantees just by investigating so at the fundamental level it's more you know we'd have to go test those assumptions Right. So a test model and then some kind of verification with the cockroach team. Um, I've got some background contacts um, that I've been kind of poking questions at. We haven't gone to the next level. The watch, ultimately, it's um, the access patterns really matter, which is we already know the act. We've talked about access patterns above multiple etcds. We actually haven't talked about the use case access patterns. So we actually need to formally define what the access pattern for Sinker and for a cross instance resource would be and define what resources we actually have to go fetch. That'll help determine the scoping of how much has to be held in memory. And then we have the scalability of watch, which is you know the combo of etcd already su supporting you know about you know, on average, about 10,000 watchers would be reasonable. And the watch cache on top of that. Also, um, we have to ask the question, the watch cache does not scale past memory. And so that is a characteristic of sharded etcd that you inherit. Um, but we would have to deal with the implications of that in Cockroach. So I'd probably say we're in the phase, we've gotten halfway through the first one, and then we would need to spend probably at least two months working through maybe like two or three different of those characteristics to get an understanding of, you know, do they hold up? Uh, do we understand the access patterns enough that we can model the, the working set of what we would need to do to hit to be client compatible, right? Like tens of thousands of small watchers on workspaces. We need to be able to answer the question, you know, do we need a watch cache to satisfy that? If you need a watch cache, then we have to have sharded KCP instances. So it's a bunch of the topology stuff trickles out of that. Um, I think that's probably something maybe we could even try to get the exploration documented. Maybe that's like something Steve, you and I could work on is try to get the topics for exploration, have those up for review, and then that would give us a rough estimate of what still needs to be understood before we could um, make a broader discussion about this or make a broader decision about the different avenues. And so in the meantime, while this ex exploration is going on, the proposal is that we just run KCP as a single non-HA uh, service backed by a single etcd. And that should meet our scale for the immediate future to be able to prototype stuff, build stuff on top, understand usage patterns, things like that. Is that it? HA, HA is it? not connected, I think. HA, no, HA is, is not connected. connected. So, so is, Why? is GKE still? single instance api they yeah. added an option to support ha i don't actually know how broadly used it is it was single instance for the first five years but do, do so, we care so the, why do yes, we care about that? because when you have an ha triplet or five or whatever you have the 
problem of am I locked? Like, do I have consensus on which API server has seen what value in the store? Yeah, yeah, of, of, of course. But um, is this something we have to, to decide now? No, I mean, um, on if so I think it depends on what we expect from the next couple of months, right? Like, I think if so, like the quota situation seems like something that would be very useful in a multi tenant environment. Will we need to defend against malicious or broken high write rate, high write amount clients in a multi-tenant service aimed at end users? Will end users have access to the ability to write things into workspaces? Yes. We need a reasonable quota mechanism. If we believe there's gaps, we can potentially paper over those. But the option left is if you need the gap, if you need to basically be able to close the gap, uh, as the service ramp us, ramps up, it's just a matter of time until you need some protection there. And so it's the, do you start by saying, we're not going to have any protection and then we need the complex approach? Or do you leave the room for the, we can do a more straightforward, simpler approach that fits within the bounds of the problem? And Steve and I were just bouncing off like numbers and stuff, at least in the proposed like initial ramp up, you get some experience with 10,000 workspaces maybe. Um, if we were to be at 100,000 workspaces, potentially be changing some of these time points. Um, if we're at 5,000 workspaces or 2,000, or uh, you know, we're able to keep the, we actually have lots of workspaces, but the key size is small per workspace. That may be a different set of factors, but um, HA really just comes down to ease of implementation versus do you actually need HA? And then we had the discussion about like, you don't actually need HA etcd to hit your SLAs um, as long as you understand how long it takes to update, how long it takes to start and restart your expected in interruption. And so that's what we were kind of working around is like, use the error budget for what it's worth, um, which is time to upgrade or time to recover, I mean. In other words, we we keep the door open that we build solutions which conflict with HA. Correct. If and it then, makes things simpler, yeah. And, and then that gives us the option to implement those options as and when we need them. And then yeah. we'll, we'll, if we need those implementations sooner versus later, we have some options around that. And again, there's always the possibility of doing the more complex layer on top or in front. And we have the mechanisms within Cube. I think you brought that up. Like we could use resource quota. We could even do specific targeted fixes to improve resource quota. Um, we could even do a specific series of hacks. It's just opening, making sure we have the most number of options to hit the SLA, but don't try to blow the SLA out of the water with like the perfect service. Like that's not what the ramp would look like. The ramp would look like get the experience and feedback to make a good decision about the, the the more than one etcd scale that's probably the most important problem that a control control plane has to solve is scaling past single instance and i think it'd be a priority inversion if we fixated on a bunch of the other smaller stuff um, and that's kind of steve's argument i think Steve, is there another, did you, was this your primary write-up? Was there another write-up? This was, that. this is the primary one. Maybe we can just add some of the notes that we've discussed here into the uh, option one, option two doc. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think I'll try to summarize there. And then um, I think that's a good place for us to split out like avenues for investigation for option two. And SLA and service requirements, like, where are we capturing that today? Do we feel like we have a single place to say like, if you wanted to run the control plan as a service, here's the series of things we're considering in use cases, and then here's the rough ordering so that we could actually document, you know, why we're doing these trade-offs as we walk away up the chain. Do we have any ideas what option three is? If, so we've we've spent a lot of time figuring out option one is huge, and maybe we should investigate option two. If we figure out in a couple months that option two is huge, and we should try something else, do we have any idea what something else might be? 
Well, we already know option two has. So the, the problem with option two is if the underlying geo distribute, you can't break apart the security or failure domain or upgrade uh, implications of that geo distributed database. So if somebody accidentally does delete, you know, drop drop table star dot star. Um, you've just taken down your entire global geo resilient control plane. And so that's a use case discussion. So then the question would be, do you actually still want to be able to break it up? In which case that's, there's an option three, which is a hybrid of one and two, which is you could, you know, focus on option two more for the super high scale use cases, which is somebody who has tens of millions of keys in a single workspace. Um, you could, but you may still potentially need workspaces to be able to do cross shard listing. Um, then there's maybe an option four, which I don't think we've really, I haven't spent a ton of time on option four yet, but it basically comes down to, I think all of this comes down to what is the most important characteristic beyond scale of a control plane? And some of that is feedback and user feedback. Like if someone comes and says, I like a global control plane, but I want to break it into two halves that can't be compromised from one another but I want clients of it to not care about the difference because perhaps they share a consistent identity service, right? I'm always gonna have, I may, I may end up with one root of trust for identity, but I want two specific control planes and I want to hard fence one control plane to a set of users. And I wanna put all of the problems like um, who has root access to my cloud accounts. That's all in control plane A. And control plane A can only see these users and I'm a, I get warm fuzzies from it. And I know that unless somebody roots AWS IAM, you know, for instance, they can't get access to the service. Those are functional requirements for control plane. We're kind of like kind of building up to asking those. I'd say we've kind of sketched out a few. That's really, I think, what determines one versus two versus three, which is the scale one. If we sell the scale one and we've missed the other non-functionals, that's a real problem. Because ultimately someone may come to us and say, yeah, I want to have, I want to, I want to break on data protection privacy, I want to break on security boundaries, I want to break on, um, I want to have this chunk in um, AWS cloud or in a gov cloud that's independent. And then I want to have an on-premise version. The on-premise version is my, we talked a couple of these scenarios, the on-premise one is the one that is the controller for all the rest of them. It doesn't participate in global sharding. It doesn't, it doesn't participate in cross shard queries. Um, except from the inside or something like that. So like some of these get into, we need to do, we need to be very pragmatic about what use cases we're going to target. I'm a little worried about jumping to the scale one, but we know that we're going to hit the scale one almost right away. Like that is the beauty and the curse of cube is the problem for cube is local failure domain with bounded working set inside memory. And we're trying to find the minimum set of trade-offs that get you some of the key properties there outside of working set. Um, and the, so I, I think this is probably, this is something in the next month that is a key focus for Rob, myself, um, you know, like we should be articulating a couple of trade-off questions and what to go search for. We should be accumulating data from stuff beyond the scale trade-offs. And we should kind of, as we start ramping up the service side, be able to get good um, exploration points that may help figure out option four might be, we don't actually need some of the the cross stuff from a security thing, in which case, like, you know, maybe the option two does become more palatable. Conversely, you might find that um, option two is not successful. I still think chasing yeah. at least the basics of option two is, is reasonable from the scale yeah. perspective. No, I, I completely agree. So, so, so it sounds like, right, at a high level, we don't know how people will use us, either how users will use us or how our own components will effectively use the other components. And so we've done enough work on option one to know that here's how it falls over, here's how it works well, here's where it will be operationally difficult. Go explore option two. It makes me, that sounds fun. I agree, thumbs up. Uh, if option three is some hybrid of option one and option two where customers who fit inside option one use option one and customers who fit inside option two use option two and that's what we call a hybrid option three. That makes me a little nervous I don't know if that's like actually what we'll do, uh, but that makes me a little nervous because now we have the operational overhead of understanding and operating both option one and option two and deciding which users go into bucket one and bucket two and like when do they grow out of option one into two and we gotta like migrate. So 
and that's fine. Like, like we don't need to completely nail option three either, or option four, five, and six. I just want to know. I mean, you, this, this is a good answer to my question: option, is what's next if this doesn't? Yeah, you might argue that option three is actually an execution option, which could be. Uh, you might actually be able to, for instance, get an option two off the ground faster than getting the cross shard stuff right. In which case, you can go from scale, you know, ten thousand workspaces, possibly all the way to scale, you know, million workspaces with some cheats and some hacks, without actually attacking sharding. And then, you know, if you you can still run multiple instances of that, so you've kind of got a you've given yourself a little bit more headroom to the go look at option one more seriously. Um, that's mm -hmm. one way to think about option three. And then option four could be as a result of exploring this, when we understand the use cases, uh, something else may come up. Um, Cause we haven't really defined like the span of control for a control plane. And that's where users, like honestly, we need a prototype three style homogenous user experience to be like, hey, here's a control plane. It will scale to this. What are some ways that you'd use a control plan like this from actual yeah. consumers, users, adopters, um, people who are like, oh, we've always wanted this, but we definitely would never run. We would want two hard isolated components and we want you know, these guys to be the overseer of the developers. And that's just how we write. Cool, that's a different use case than what we've talked about so far with, with global control plan. Yeah, I agree. I think now's the time to like step back, let users actually use it, see how they use it, and make decisions based on you know real data. Does any is anyone else uh, listening, following along, and having burning feedback to give to the conversation? It's mostly been the three or four of us. Don't want to leave anybody out. All right, I guess not. Uh, is there? Excellent. How's the how's the wall? Uh, <laughs> good, good. Uh, uh, yeah, I think we'll learn a lot from putting this in front of actual people and see. You know, like like all things, like don't push that button. Why are you pushing that button? That's not the button for you to push. Uh, we will learn after users touch it that that was the button they push. Yeah, and also I'll just add one more note, like option two, I've had a lot of behind the scenes informal interest from a lot of different people who have cube-like problems or single cluster scale problems that there's some appetite for. And so that's at least something to consider is, uh, you know, we've it's definitely coming up that there may be some interest in option two purely in the cube sense. That is why Kine exists. And that's one of the advantages, like, a, uh, Rancher uses it for fleet manager at, you know, oh, 100,000 uh, subdomain scales. And so is, that's a... Um, is Kind more than... My, my understanding of Kind might be incomplete. Is Kind mostly a uh, an alternative to using etcd that uses SQLite? Or is it any yeah. SQL... Kind, kind is a SQL is an adapter that em, emulates okay. the specific etcd APIs, gRPC etcd APIs that Cube calls, and it applies a generic SQL abstraction, so it can work against multiple SQL types. As a consequence of that, it has to simulate watch in its data model, which means that you are effectively layering multi multi-version concurrency on top of um, SQL, which means your data model in SQL is layered on top of whatever the underlying database's multi-version semantic is. The reason why Cockroach is interesting is because Cockroach actually exposes the multi-version semantic, which means you've cut out that that abstraction. Um, kind would probably also be, an, a, an, a, this may actually be an, a short-term option too, which we can do like a 2A and 2B. Kind would actually potentially help us get to like 100,000 or 200,000 scale. Uh, for a single instance to a to thousand workspace, like would probably give us close to at least half an order of magnitude or an order of magnitude. So that might actually be a, a time extender while we evaluate other options. I think Cockroach potentially is the only one I've seen though that still gives you like full geo distribution as well as like geo replication, as well as the ability to transparently move data, as well as the underlying semantic is the database semantic, which means 
watches as efficient as the underlying store. Um, so you know, the mechanical sympathy works there is the biggest concern. Uh, all right, Steve, and uh, anything else you want to add, Stefan, any last thoughts or we can move on to, I was just going to say that Andy put something down there in case. Oh, yeah. excellent. Uh, well, let's go to that. I think we've exhausted this topic. Thanks. Uh, go ahead. I have been working along with lots of folks on the call in getting the code base up to date and workable for prototype two for a demo. I have a pull request open that starts the starts adding a script for running the demo. It is not in any way done. Um, what I've discovered in writing it is a series of um, some issues, small, some big, with uh, just either flakes or issues in the test code or flakes or issues in some of our um, controllers and logic. So uh, I want to thank everybody who's been helping. And I am continuing to work on um, closing out some of the issues that are prohibiting the demo from proceeding. So um, in the short term, I'm essentially entirely focused on that. And uh, again, I appreciate everybody who's been helping out. So as soon as we can close out Prototype 2, I, uh, I know, as Paul said, or Paul wrote at the beginning of the meeting, we will be talking about um, Prototype 3 tasks, but some high priority code things that we'd like to get in uh, as soon as Proto 2 is done are getting the Kubernetes 123 rebase in. I've been periodically going back to my branch and trying to keep that up to date as we make some changes to um, the 122 branch, although I probably don't have the latest stuff with the refactoring that you did stuff on for starting things up. And after the rebase is in, I will try and get my scope being work finished. And uh, then hopefully everybody can take advantage of all of that goodness. So that's, um, that's where the demo stands right now. Um, maybe we could try and hold off on merging any, any major refactorings until we get the demo script closed out. Um, that'll because if there's refactorings that come in, I may make it uh, take longer for me to get the demo finished. Yeah, uh, Andy, thank you for your heroic work in getting this uh, in a state where it's demoable at all. Uh, when I, I know that we got rid of it uh, in favor of end-to-end -end tests, and I think that was also a good idea. But for a while, we had the demo one script running as part of our CI, just to make sure that we, as we were making improvements to the system that we weren't breaking the demo because we broke the demo a bunch. Uh, is there any interest either from you or from anyone else or disinterest in putting it in as a CI check just in the, it is effectively an end-to-end -end test. It's, it's the end, end to endest test we have, uh, which means both it will cover the most and will break the easiest. Uh, does anybody, how do you feel? Last one. I'm, 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 not sure to to now. <laughs> I'm not a fan of, I mean, OpenShift, we had the command tests for a long time, which were like that, they are hard to maintain. And when things change, um, that breaks. It's easier to fix code in this phase, which is typed, than having a script, which is not typed. Yeah, I mean, I, I've noticed yeah. that some of the result.txt files, which the demos compare against, like we changed an error message and now the demo fails. <laughs> um, I, I, I would say the lesson from the CLI tests is don't write them in shell, write them in code in, the, in executing this, the thing. Like they're good, they're good integration or higher EDE level tests, but they're very bad. Like shell just doesn't work for that. Um, yeah. I do feel like a translation layer that takes the shell and makes it into EDE. Did that ever merge? I think this. We we ran it, was a big, it. it got us halfway there, you know. It was a shim. But like it's a big step. Um 
so Marvel uh, su suggested to uh, to run kind tests in end to end, and this is basically what the demo is, right? That's a big difference. Having a real cluster with real compute, but coded in Go, as Clay says. Yeah, and, and let's be clear: this this is something that we we want to be able to have a good experience for people who are kicking the tires. And we need some way of having that be super easy and automated as possible. In code, sure. Some of it, may, maybe. I mean, I'm not. I don't really care whether it's in code or in Bash. Bash sucks, but we need something that's comprehensible to the average person, and it needs to be validated so it's not constantly breaking. Yeah, I just think whenever we find ourselves like editing shell scripts to add complexity a part of me dies inside. And I think if the problem of starting KCP and the surrounding things is no different in a E to E test than it is in a demo or a startup or whatever, we might as well just do it and go and it, do like the, the runtime handling it correctly once. Other options is like, um, you still need to, ex like somewhat, the, the reason we did the shell script was to actually automate doing the demo recording because we actually were struggling to get a repeatable demo recording and being able to use the shell for that was very valuable. I would probably say, um, I might actually suggest, you. we need a good doc that explains the demo in clear human language with the minimum number of dependencies, like to Maru's point. Um, I might suggest as an option, like put it in Markdown and then go through the steps and run those steps and look for all the places where someone has to inject a external dependency. Those are usually places where end users fail. That might be another one. Um, we did this in Cube a couple of times where like, you know, we read Markdown and par parsed out the objects and validated them. Like at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how good the system is if no one tries it. The primary user you're trying to serve is the person who comes to that page and says, I want to understand what this does. And if you don't get your message across, there's no point to having the project, right? The project is an abject failure over of being over things. So I think like if we want to test that end users are successful, there are multiple ways you can observe that, but a very concrete way is making sure you don't break an actual sequence that should reliably work. If you want to have a doc and keep the Go code and say, great. If you want to have a Go code that, you know, looks at a structure and does certain steps, sure. But uh, I think the, the shell code is not the important part. It is the actual sequence of steps, what it means. And that does not break because if that fails, no one succeeds at trying the, the, the demo. Yeah, I mean, for, for what it's worth, uh, I also died a little bit inside when I you know, even lightly suggested having our tests be in Bash. Uh, I don't, I don't want that either. My, uh, the reason for wanting anything like that at all is sort of like Clayton says, like, it works. We get a demo, we record that demo, we put it in the README, everyone's happy, and then a week later, a totally unrelated change breaks it, and it, the next user that wants to go try it out, and is frustrated and just leaves. I don't know, like, there is no good solution to this. We should have end-to-end -end tests and go because that's. A, a real programming language for adults, um, but well, uh, adults. is there a translation layer between um, if you if you increment the verbosity of client go far enough? Is there something that'll take that and make you control there snippets with it? Was curl before, not not. I, I know it exposes the curl, but I'm wondering if if we run an intent test with high enough verbosity, and then we just like automate creating the demo script with it. But you, I bet you could write a, um, actually, okay, actually, let's take this back. If you write good enough, like a Go flow, and that actually is your demo, and someone reading that, like, you could just take that Go file and turn it back into a markdown script, like, turn the comments into paragraphs, and you're explaining what each step does, that might be another option. Um, generate the markdown from the Go code of the test or something. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I am entirely happy not to continue to hack together a script that has to be flawless and maintained and whatnot. I want to record an ASCII cinema. I would like to have human readable language, as you said, Clayton, that makes it easy for people to understand and try it out. Um, but if we're not going to maintain the bash in perpetuity, I don't think it makes sense to check it in um because yeah. we have done zero jobs of keeping it functional as the code has evolved 
So, so I'm happy to do go and try and come up with something that can kick out Markdown or, or whatever. So uh, key goals, prototype two and prototype three, is that you have established showing the potential of KCP as a prototype for these three big ideas. The only metric that matters from the perspective of the repo, the readme, and the flow is, do you get that idea across? And so the metric here is people succeeding at that. Everything else we do is irrelevant, or everything else we do is in support of that metric. So we're optimizing for the metric of, you come to our readme, and you successfully see the potential either by watching, reading, or trying. And the trying is the one that we need to make sure it doesn't break. So the the what is the ideal mechanism that gets that? Yeah, is, is up to the folks, but like that's the metric we were optimizing for. Maybe and, maybe the solution go the the most scalable solution is have some script. Uh don't check it into the repo, or if we check it into the repo, say this is this was last seen working against commit ABC to try this yourself, check out commit ABC and run it against that. You won't get recent changes since then, but that's probably good because we probably broke the demo script since then. I'm actually, I mean, we can do that. That That is a short-term win, but I, I like the idea of trying to write a little framework in Go that can generate bash scripts that work with demo magic, but also that will run i don't know that i mean like it, like the ascii cinema is probably something that you're going to do once maybe yeah. you don't optimize for that bit you definitely need to be able to get a clean doc that we know that that doc works like if the doc doesn't work we have failed so the well, doc they're, they're one in the same though i mean yeah. whether it's demo magic or like a markdown file that says go run this then go run that like it's still running all the same yeah things. I, I, just, I, I didn't want to, we, we, the, the demos magic script, like, I think it'd be fine if that dies like that. Okay. That was only so that I could step through recording a video as we led up to the May. Yeah. Conference. And it just, it hung around because we had nothing else. Let's make the net, nothing else replace it. Okay. Cool. And I will stop rewriting all of our intent tests and bash now that I've heard feedback from the community that we don't want that. Just make it POSIX compliant, it'll be fine. No, no, I won't. Uh, all right. Uh, anything else? Do we all, uh, by the way, um, uh, Stefan and Andy, do we ever make a, a decision on whether we should auto detect the F sync thing for Max? Like, that seems like a really heinous that thing that everyone on Mac trying this out will hit. Well. So I'll just look um, at the moment. So to explain for those who aren't familiar with what Steve was talking about, um, the on etcd or in etcd, uh, it it uses fsync by default to avoid data cor corruption. Um, the implementation of fsync on Mac was corrected several Go versions ago to you do a full sync, which makes it slower. And but but it is correct. So like functionally, it's working the way that it needs to. It just means that if you're trying to run etcd on a Mac, it tends to run a little bit slower than it might otherwise. And um, there is a flag you can set, especially if you are on a single node etcd or single member etcd, to tell it not to use fsync. It's it's marked unsafe for a good reason, but it does speed things up. So. I don't know does that it, we want to auto detect, but we may want to. Does it cause um, those? Is the stuff that we saw with Etsy just totally barfing everywhere and falling over? That was only when it was being run in some high amount of concurrency in tests. That doesn't happen in a single instance on a laptop. Um, so I was running KCP yesterday, single instance, not part of a test. Uh, I didn't have the flag turned on, so fsync was enabled, and I did see at least one log message saying that etcd took more than 100 milliseconds to do an apply. So I think um, log message is fine. I think the point at which it tips over into like API instability is probably not good. But if it doesn't seem to be happening, then we can probably ignore it. I haven't seen any instances of it falling over with one copy of everything. So yeah. I spin up the servers, I, like I spin up KCP in the virtual workspace server, 
and then I work with cube control, I haven't seen it fall apart. It's okay. really only been in the EDE tests, but that they are significantly weird. faster, <laughs> even if you're doing, um, you know, one uh, parallel one, it's still significantly faster. Gotcha. I was really surprised that, yeah, F-Sync on Mac takes like a hundred times more than Linux, but <laughs> whatever. <laughs> okay, cool. It doesn't sound like we need to like call that out in the review. I just didn't want like a new user like starting KCP and just having a CD fall over. Like what is going on here? No, I mean, I think we're better off um, having a correct, you know, data corruption free <laughs> version of etcd running by default um, than, than otherwise. Cool. Uh, we have a few minutes left, but David also added uh, an item two minutes ago. Uh, yeah, just a heads up, heads up that some of you saw a pull request uh, at the end of last week, Thursday. Uh, where I was proposing having a dedicated cube config for the virtual workspaces. Uh, that was mainly related to the fact that until now, um, the KC the generated cube config generated by KCP mainly was using the loops back client certificates, which are cannot be shared with any other external component. So it was not possible to share the certs between uh, both components, KCP and and um, the virtual workspaces command. Now that um, I just fixed that, uh, it's possible to have a very transparent way to access the virtual workspaces, even if you are just, if even if your current cube config is the admin cube config generated by by KCP. So uh, even if you're on the admin cube config and admin context, if you point to uh, if you try to access, for example, the KCP um, workspace plugin without any change, you can uh, get the list of the workspaces. It mainly takes the current workspace and just change the the port and uh, I mean port or path accordingly according to the the need, and uh, and everything works. So that should this time, I assume, uh, enable to simplify the correct uh, in a better way the prototype to. Uh, scenario so yeah uh, feedback welcome probably uh, uh, offline sorry i missed that is that already merged and in and taken into no, account it, in andy's it, uh, demo report? It, it's not merged it's um, okay. i think ps will arrive tonight or tomorrow gotcha. morning I've but at least feedbacks on the on, <laughs> on on the principle and the id Sorry, Andy, I didn't. Uh, I said, let's merge it after I finished the, the demo prep. That was yeah, we'll see. But anyway, I, I mean, yeah. it, it will be useful <laughs> from now on, even if it doesn't come into prototype two. Cool. With that, we have a few minutes left, but I'm more than happy to stop early unless somebody has something burning a hole in their mind. All right. Take care, everyone. Have a good week. See you.